Good morning, everybody present over here. We welcome you all for the second day of the conference, International Conference on Computational Intelligence and Data Science. Now I welcome Dr. Matthew Cha Chin Heng from National University of Singapore to present the keynote address on towards digital manufacturing of patient-specific medical devices. Welcome you, sir. Thank you. A very good morning uh, to Dr. Chitra Babu, uh, Head of uh, uh, Computer Science Engineering and uh, Dr. Milton, and Dr. Prasad, and Dr. Suresh. Okay. Uh, very warm welcome to all of you all. And on behalf of the National University of Singapore, I'm very glad to be here today to deliver to you all a keynote address towards digital manufacturing of patient-specific medical devices. So basically, this keynote address okay, uh, okay, is led uh, by my team, uh, Nicholas, and uh, Professor Chu Chi Kong from uh, the National University of Singapore. Okay, so just a brief background about myself. Uh, I'm currently heading the medical and cybernetic systems at uh, the National University of Singapore. Uh, I have a research program in robotics and uh, smart health technologies. Uh, currently, we have about $2 million of funding uh, to work and develop uh, smart health to actually cope with the aging population in Singapore and also to treat illnesses and uh, help the elderly. Uh, I graduated with my PhD from NUS Singapore, and my research interests are in artificial organs, medical devices, artificial intelligence, and also in robotics. So uh, this is my email in case uh, you all would like to email me to ask or you know, collaborate on any projects. Okay, so this is the content of the presentation today. Uh, I will first introduce about digital manufacturing and what it is about. Then I will move on to the overview of the proposed intelligent digital manufacturing platform for hybrid medical implants. No worry, I know it sounds very long, huh, but actually I will explain to you all in the simpler terms. Here, huh? okay. okay, and then uh, after I will touch briefly on um, anatom anatomical background of the human body, which we are about to, uh, to address. Okay, and then the patient specific 3D modeling uh, approach of implants, material selection, virtual reality manufacturing, and then uh, we will conclude later. I will try to sum it all within an hour or less. Okay, so what is digital manufacturing? Okay, so digital manufacturing is an integrated approach to manufacturing that is centered around a computer system. So in the past, whereby we, in the past where people manufacture, they actually draw a paper and then they actually you know, manufacture by hand and then they, they do go by trial and error over several iterations. So this actually results in a lot of time and material wastage and sometimes even in uh, the failure of the product. So through digital um, means, we are able to automate and integrate 3D modeling, simulation, Knowledge bases, which is actually uh, very important in this uh, very in this current world, and then uh, analysis all at the same time, so that it also brings about the age of virtual uh, laboratories. Okay. So the estimated cost of uh, manufacturing medical devices is currently very high in Singapore, especially, and I'm, I'm maybe around the world as well, because due to manpower, time, wastage, and uh, failures, okay, you need to have vigorous testing in order they do not they do not fail halfway and also the customizability why customizability is because every one of us have different uh, you know, body size body shape different organ size and uh, volume so therefore how do we actually customize a single object you know to fit to fit everyone okay we cannot have one size fit all so how do we customize it to fit everyone so so how can the digital manufacturing solve our problems Firstly, by integrating design, modeling, and testing into a single phase, okay, this creates a robust and flexible uh, platform to create patient-specific. Okay, the keyword is patient-specific because you know in every every, every patient has different needs and different uh, body body anatomy. So we have to create patient-specific devices and implants, and this also reduces how to reduce failure rates and the need for in vitro. Okay, in vitro, the meaning of in vitro is uh, in laboratory. Okay, in vivo is within the body. Okay, so when we create medical devices, we, have, we first have to test in the laboratory outside of the body. And once it's uh, successful, then we go into the body to test in the body. And then from there, we see how it fares outside and inside the body. Yeah? Okay, and then this reduces a need for physical lab space. Okay, so this is an overview of the, it, the proposed intelligent digital manufacturing platform. Okay, so uh, just a very quick run through. We'll start with the patient specific modeling of the implant. Okay, so we have to actually get the, the model of the patient body and from there we extract information and then we design the implant according to the body. 
right? Then we input the requirement of the implant. Maybe you need it to be soft. Maybe you need it to be hard. Maybe you need it to be flexible. So we, we have to put in the, the values, right? And then we, we undergo a, what you call a material selection and optimization platform, which I will later talk more about it. Okay? This will extract information from the material knowledge base that is currently on the internet. And then uh, this will generate out possible solutions. From there, we actually uh, evaluate these solutions through a laboratory, virtual uh, VR laboratory. And then once it's successful, we will push it out to deployment or in vivo testing. So what's the novelty of this uh, intelligent system? Firstly, it's the patient-specific reconstruction, 3G, 3D reconstruction and modeling of the implant, all right? So the, the key thing is three-dimensional, three okay? So how do we do three-dimensional? It's through layering of uh, images, and then we, from there we actually do uh, segment, segmentization, and then we reconstruct in three dimension. After that, we have, can automate the medical implant design and material selection and optimization. Okay, it is the first uh, intelligence, intelligent system in the world for soft tissue implant optimization. Okay? Currently, uh, what you see outside right, is mostly for hard tissue implant like bone. Right? But when you go to soft tissue like your muscle, your trachea, your heart, okay, it's a bit more difficult because soft tissue is very much flexible and the deformation uh, factor is very high. So how do we actually uh, go, go, about, go about it? Okay. And so to employ algorithms, make use of material knowledge bases. Okay, the amount of knowledge in the internet is very, 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 very wide. Okay. How do we actually create a system that is intelligent enough to actually utilize all this knowledge? The human mind cannot use all the knowledge, but a system can do it because the system has, can do multiple parallel processing. Okay, but our human mind can only do one, one at a time. So we have to... Uh, how all these such systems are, all right? And then a virtual uh, VR manufacturing lab to evaluate the processes, and also importantly, also to train new manufacturers, all right? Currently, <coughs> if you have, if you want to train a class of people, you have to require a, a trained supervisor to train the class. But if you have a system that can train the class automatically, you can actually you know, speed up the process and uh, you can save costs as well. Okay, so today our focus is on the creation of the artificial trachea implant. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you more about the trachea. Huh? Okay, so this is the anatomy of the human bo uh, upper human body. Okay, we have uh, the nose, the mouth, okay? and this is the trachea. Okay? The trachea is actually the windpipe of the human body, okay? and it runs parallel to the osophagus. Okay, so the trachea, your trachea will somewhat look like this. Right? Okay, it's, uh, it consists of a cartilage shaped cartilage ring that is a uh, line parallel and then in the longitudinal form so it's like a tube okay and you breathe through this tube right this tube is very flexible because it allows you to bend your neck okay when you bend your neck your, your, your tube will bend also okay you rotate your head also the tube will rotate so it's very very flexible so how do we, we create such a robust and flexible um, structure in the body okay, so currently uh this is uh what happens in a lot of uh, patients with throat cancer, okay? You have a tumor, and then this tumor actually occupies and blocks the, the airway. So, most of the time, we actually go through um, what is it, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, but that, that's very uh, invasive, and most of the time, they do not survive because the invasion of the, the trachea has been is too significant. So, how do we actually uh, go about it? If actually, we will cut off the trachea, and then we will join them together. But some people have... Uh, the amount of trachea that is diseased is too much. So when you cut off, the gap is too wide to join. So how do we bridge the gap? So we have to create an implant to bridge the gap between the two trachea ends. Okay, so the, uh, I would say that the uh, artificial trachea is not something new. There are people who have already um, go about trying to create it. Okay? But currently, the, these are the, the problems faced by artificial trachea. The lack of, slow, uh, lack of or slow epithelium tissue in growth. Basically, when you create uh, the, the implant, you need the tissues, the surrounding tissue to grow into it, okay, to integrate it. If it doesn't grow into it, you will, want, you will be rejected sooner or later, all right? So you have to get it to grow into the trachea, okay? And that's so there's a mismatch of mechanical properties and size, all right? A lot of the implants are too hard or too soft, and therefore, there is a mismatch in the property between the surrounding tissues and the implants. And also, the long preparation time, okay? Sometimes you, some trackers take around eight to one, eight months to one year to create by the time the patient died already. So, <coughs> how do we actually speed up the process? 
So there's a need uh, for patient-specific implant, right? Okay, firstly, uh, it's re required for FEA, okay, finite element analysis. So how do we do it? Uh, how do we actually, you know, use computer to analyze the property? Okay, uh, differences. How do we also go about to, you know, tackle the differences in the anatomical dimensions between the individuals? Okay, simulation using patient's imaging data, and to achieve if, uh, stress distribution in the implant. Okay, and then, therefore, there is the importance of uh, material modeling. Okay? So, what is material modeling? Basically, it's a prediction of the material properties. Okay, it's required in simulation-based design. It provides a, a physical and mathematical explanation to material behavior. And uh, <coughs> therefore, we actually use uh, attenu attenuation, which is actually uh, dampening models and mechanical models to uh, predict the uh, implant behavior. Okay, so this is uh, one book that I did uh, during my PhD. Okay, we actually created the implant to uh, re replace the patient and animal. So what we did was we actually CT scan the, the patient. Okay, we get the size of the, the trachea. And from there, we actually do segmentization to extract the shape out. So you can see, uh, this is the shape. So we actually generalize the shape to be an elliptic, elliptical shape. So there's a mi uh, minor radii and a major radii. From there, we reconstruct the shape of the artificial trachea, and then we uh, 3D printed the trachea out. So this material is actually uh, CNT PDMS, which is carbon nanotube combined together with uh, polydimethyl siloxane. Right? <coughs> so this is, you can see it's black color, it's, uh, because of the CNT, the carbon nanotubes. So after we created it, okay, uh, we also used the, the patient data to reconstruct the trachea uh, using computational model. Right, and then we implant the, the model of the design trachea into the patient's trachea and then we perform simulation studies with the combined model. The combined model, alright. Okay, so now uh, <coughs> now I will move on to the overview of the material selection and optimization platform. So remember just now I, I mentioned that you know there's so much material properties and uh, data on the internet. So how do we actually uh, design a system that can actually use and you know, uh, make use of all this knowledge to construct a hybrid uh, material um, implant. Okay, so firstly, uh, this is the overview. Okay, we have the biomaterial knowledge base, okay, which is a knowledge base from the internet. Okay, the system actually clusters the materials into different cluster, cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, all the way under cluster N. All right? And then from there, uh, they will actually, first we will see whether the, okay, we will first input the Biological requirements. Do you need the, the implant to be bioactive? Do you need to be you know, biodissolvable? So all this kind of uh, di this kind of properties. So you will later okay, the, the machine will actually uh, check whether this cluster meets the requirements. If not, reject cluster. Okay? If it does meet the requirement, okay, you will add the cluster to the selected pool of uh, clusters. After that, we will use a genetic algorithm. Okay? To optimize the cluster composition. So, how much percentage of uh, each material in the cluster do you need? Do you need 50% uh, steel, 10% maybe plastic, or 5% um, PCL? So, we do not know. So, we use genetic algorithm to actually find the optimal um, cluster composition. And from there, we will actually un undergo uh, finite element simulation okay, using the, the patient specific implant model that just now I just showed you, the one that was reconstructed in, 3, in 3D. Yeah. So we will use it to use uh, to do the finite simulation. Then we will see if the results are acceptable. If not, we reject the cluster. If it is, then we will identify it as one of the possible solutions. Uh, so far, any any question? Or not? Am I too fast, or are you uh, lost? If if any question, you don't, just feel free to stop me halfway to ask the question. Okay? Like if you do not know any terms or what, you just stop me halfway. Uh. Okay. So. Uh, now we'll move on deeper into the uh, biomaterial knowledge base. Uh. So the biomaterial knowledge base is an open source uh, knowledge base. Okay, that is a source of material behavior and properties. So this knowledge base will have uh, stuff like you know the the materials, uh, down modulus, the Poisson ratio, the stress, uh, the shear modulus, every all this kind of uh, data. Okay, and then we will use rule-based classification algorithm to sort out the material into potential. Composite combination. So maybe this is like cooking class. Huh? How do you know that maybe this 
rice and maybe uh, certain certain kind of curry will go well together. So we will have to actually create recipes. Okay. So basically, this uh, rule based classification create recipes for the. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, mean, I think I use. Okay, so what is rule-based classification? So rule-based classification is the selection of candidate materials to form a new composite, right? So we actually use a systematic method utilizing rules to streamline down the possible combinations. Okay, some things do not go well with each other, so we must actually select. How do we select? So we place in rules to help to streamline this material uh, selection process. So rule-based classification, all right, okay, in, a, in an expert system, a rule is a conditional statement. If X condition is satisfied, then outcome is Y. Okay? So for this rule base, we actually input multiple rules to actually streamline down the cluster. So for example, okay, if within a cluster, if at least one of the materials have a young modulus less than the required value, and at least one material has a modulus more than the required value, a cluster is accepted. If not discard. Okay, so this is an example of a rule based uh, method that we use to streamline the process. Okay. So the rule implemented can be expanded to cover many physical properties like you know, density, strength, electrical resistivity, uh, maybe bioactiveness, maybe uh, yeah, many, many kinds, okay? bioabsorbance. So the greater the number of rules generated into the system, the more efficient and effective your process of streamline. So the more rules you put in, right? Example, like you search Google, if you put in more search items, your search become more accurate. I mean by right, right? Your search should become more accurate. So same thing, uh, the more rules you put into the system, right? You can streamline the selection uh, more accurately into the kind of materials that you would like to use for your implants. Okay, and then after that, we will use genetic algorithm Okay, GA. I think this one should be quite familiar to most of you all uh, <coughs> for the, those, those doing undergraduate and graduate studies. Okay, GA algorithm. So it's the most commonly used uh, evolutionary optimization technique. Okay, so basically I won't go into details so much, right? So basically the GA will actually help to, uh, okay, this is, these are the steps. Uh, so I won't go into details so much. Okay, so they have the population, in initialization, uh, parent selection, modification, survival selection, and Etc. Etc. And then it's an iterative process. Okay, this one you can uh, go online and read. It's a very very uh, well known kind of uh, method. So it's not not new, but, uh, okay. But then how do we select what? Okay, after we go through the genetic algorithm, how do we select the cluster? How do we actually choose which cluster is good? So this is the fitness assessment that I proposed, right? So the fitness is of the genotype can be can be calculated using this uh, formula, right? And then we also use the objective function to monitor the fitness of the genotype. So to actually see how well is the optimization. Is it still optimizing significantly? If it's not, then we cut off the, the iterative process and then we use it as the final result. Okay, so these are the two um, algorithms that uh, we actually use. Okay, so then after, now once we have the system in place, we apply it to create the artificial track here. The, the biomaterial, uh, the, the composite. So, okay, we have, we gener first we generate the list of uh, the knowledge base. So this is the knowledge base. We have from nylon, epoxy, PLA, PCL, all the way down until PADMS. And we have a whole range of uh, material data. Okay, 
So we, for this purpose of simulation study, we choose uh, tensile strength and flexural uh, moduli, okay, because of the trachea. So the trachea is very uh, flexible and very strong. So we choose these two properties, okay, and then we the we the rules that we implement in this case, okay, is to such that the cluster acceptance is equal to the tensile modulus, flexural modulus, and density. Okay, and then this is the clustering that we we have. Okay, we have the different cluster. Okay, cluster one is PE, uh, polyethylene, PLGA, TNT, and then cluster, cluster two is PE, PLLA, alumna, and so on and so forth. All right, so from this uh, generator sets of cluster, all right, we can eliminate what according to the, our needs and requirement. All right, and then uh, finally, the PDMS, CNT, carbon nanotube, and uh, silver composite was chosen due to the bio biological properties of non-biodegradability, antibacterial, and bioactiveness. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, yeah, this is the final composite that was generated. Huh? Okay. So after that, uh, we based on this composite, okay, we put it through the genetic algorithm to optimize the composition. So you can see uh, these are the parameters. So let's, for example, if we shift the weights, you can shift the weights. Uh, how much weights you want to put in each uh, material? So let's say if I put equal weights into all, uh, what is that? What is it? Uh, modulus one, modulus two, and uh, this the density. Okay, we get this result, and then so on and so forth. So the G the algorithm will terminate after twenty uh, generations of uh, iteration. Okay, once we have the the so called the desired composition and the desired material, okay, we put into the our multi physics simula simulation studies. Okay, so all this all actually supposed to be automated. So the system will automate all this process all at one go. We do not need to do anything for it, right? So the only thing actually we need to do is to put in what we want, our desired uh, in input. Ah, or the phone. Ah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, right. Sorry. Okay. So. Okay, so this is the original trachea of the patient. So we remove uh, two or three rings, okay, two or three cartilage rings out, and then we plant in the implant. And you can see that surrounding the rings is the mucosal membrane. It's, it's not just a ring dangling in mid-air. Eh? It's the membrane that is holding the rings together. All right, and then the, and the implant is here. So as you can see, it's all one whole solid system that is actually what you will see in your body after you implant inside. Okay, from there, we do our simulation study the stretching, sideway bending, and from the studies you can see the different stress distributions of the rings. Okay, the cartilage ring distributions. And you can see uh, the ra the redder the is, like the higher stress probability. Uh. so usually when you see it as very red, this is where the stress concentration is very high. So the portion you need to actually be more more careful uh, because it will it might fail in the body, which has happened several times. So there were several failed experiments where the implant fill in the body and then the subject died. Okay, so it's very important that you must actually design carefully such that the portion where it's very red, yet the highest stress concentration has the most is the strongest in structural integrity. Yeah? Okay. So after that once we have the implant and everything is um, you know all, all well okay we move on to the virtual reality uh, lab okay for manufacturing evaluation okay so we have to also evaluate whether how we are, are we going to manufacture this implant and uh, is it feasible to manufacture and how do we teach it to the operators okay so the use of conventional laboratory okay has many issues firstly contamination and safety risks okay you have seen news of you know many Laboratory fires, people getting poisoned or even cut. All right, in the lab. So these are all safety hazards huh, in the lab. Okay, there's also a long setup period. Okay, and then it requires firstly very high skill and experience of the operator. Okay, not anyone can walk in. Okay, if you ask me to walk in and to do certain experiment or so, I also cannot do because you must be very, you must be trained and skilled. All right, and then high cost. 
right? The, the equipment and stuff all will cost in the thousands and millions. So you need a virtual reality based laboratory to actually help to evaluate the process and also to train the potential human operators in a safe environment. Okay, so this is the overview. Okay, it's a very simple overview okay, of the virtual reality training laboratory. Okay, so firstly, we create the virtual environment. Okay, the virtual environment will actually be supervised by a virtual reality supervisor. All right, and this uh, supervisor, which is a virtual bot, okay, will interact with the operator, which is the person wearing the virtual reality set. And then this person will actually work in this virtual environment. So you can see it's a, it's a closed loop process uh, of the environment, operator, supervisor, and the channel of uh, communication. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, okay, there will be two, two main, view, two main uh, components, which are the virtual environment and the interactive channel. All right, I will go in detail later. Okay, so this is the training uh, flow chart. So let's say, how do we train the operator? Right, this is the flow process. Usually we will start training tutorial one. Then after we, we do a demonstration, the operator will do the, the work. And then from there, we assess whether pass or fail. Okay, the system will assess basically. If fail, then you'll go back again. If pass, you'll proceed on. Okay, and then we'll, we'll just do in a sequence, sequential state uh, from you know, familiarity of materials, step-by-step -step assembly, and then practice, etc., etc. Okay, and then this one is the VR supervisor algorithm. Okay, so this you can uh, slowly just see through. Right, we start with the assembly. Okay, so the, the tutorial will be given by the supervisor. And then they will have the practice assembly. So if the user requires help, okay, the, the supervisor will actually give the step-by-step -step instruction. If not, the user will perform the assembly and then uh, they will be assessed accordingly. Okay, if it's okay, and then you will proceed on. If not, the supervisor will actually step in to give instructions again to really demonstrate how to do the task. Okay, this is the VR finite state machine uh, that we will implement into the system. Okay, so basically you start from here and then we will you know end at F. So at each step there will be a there will be a finite state of uh, of uh, process. Okay, at, uh, this finite state machine is not new also, so it's, you can just check online uh, it's, uh, there is there. Okay, so the VR application uh, so. Basically, the VR lab, okay, we can use uh, many open source uh, software like Unity, right? Unity or Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine, I'm sure most of you are familiar because those who play games, uh, okay, you use Unreal Engine. Uh, those can create a very realistic environment and stuff. So with Unreal and Unity, uh, okay, they have uh, basic physics-based modeling, okay, which uh, includes uh, you know, collision detection, object manipulation, and, and stuff. Right? So it's a platform that houses all virtual reality uh, activities. Right? So, you have your tutorial practices and assessment all in the VR lab. Okay, this is an example of one that we created. So you can see that uh, the person actually when, you, when doing the VR lab, right, you have to wear some sort of a sensor. So usually it's a, it comes in the form of a glove with sensors. So whatever you move in real life, your hands in the virtual reality will move also. So you can grab stuff and when you grab items, the glove have a haptic feedback. So it will, it will vibrate. To, 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 Tell you that you have grabbed the object. The object is in your hand, okay, and then you you vibrate and stuff. So the user can feel at the same time. So you can you can see the table. There is all the objects that is required. Your your beaker, your PDMS, your weighing machine, okay, and maybe some uh, instruments there to do. So you can actually from here you can actually uh, see that the user can you know do the uh, perform the task, and then each step right, there will be uh you no know, this is the channel where the VR supervisor will guide you. So you will tell you, say, uh, you know, pick up, the, pick up the item and, you know, pour stuff and stuff. For example for this, see? step one, pour the PDMS pre-polymer into a beaker. Step two, pour this and do that. Step three, so you, the, the hand is, sorry, the hand here is not, not moving, uh, <laughs> because there's something wrong with the program. Okay, it will actually move together with the beaker and, and stuff. Okay, at each step, the person will be actually supervised and then they'll be assessed accordingly. Okay, so in uh, conclusion, all right, there's a huge availability of a huge knowledge base for biomaterials, all right, and then for us as human beings, we cannot use, 
possibly utilize all the knowledge base. So we need to have create an intelligent system, an expert system, to effectively harness and utilize the knowledge base to, to create hybrid material models that we do not even know of. Okay? And then from there, okay, the, we can build on the intelligent digital manufacturing platform to help produce more effective hybrid medical implants in a shorter time and a lower cost. And lastly, the platform will integrate artificial intelligence, knowledge base, and VR in a seamless uh, fashion. Okay, I think that's all for uh, my part. Yeah. Any, any questions? Sorry? Tissue-based diseases. Diseases, yeah. So, uh, correct. So, he asked uh, whether is it possible to design an implant for tissue-based diseases. Yeah. So, basically, this uh, trachea um, implant is the example of an implant for tissue-based diseases because the trachea is a soft tissue and then we, when we remove it, we have to create an implant to replace it. So, this, this uh, implant that, uh, we, uh, that is presented today is basically the implant that is meant for tissue-based uh, diseases. Uh, yes. Oh, no worry. Of the knee implant, is it? Okay. So, uh, okay. Thank you for your question. For knee implants, uh, okay, like I said earlier on, okay, knee implants okay, will be considered as hard implant, right? This, this implant that we talked about today is soft implant. So, Heart implant will be somewhat easier because for heart implants, the shape and the volume is more or less fixed. Right? It's more of you're you are just building strength to actually to replace the, the cavity of the, of the removed uh, tissue. So for knee implants, uh, you can use the same process. Okay? You go through the same process and then instead of uh, for the input, right, you will just need to modify the input such that it fits the, your, the property of your knee. Yeah, and the shape of the knee. So same thing, you can also use, um, you can treat CT scan your knee to get the, the shape of the object of your knee out and then we can recreate them in, uh, in this uh, intelligent system. Yeah. Sorry? Flexibility. Flexibility. Yes. Because for knee, my knee is concerned. Hmm. One. Knees concern okay. in India uh, when after replacement they can't able to fold the legs actually. Hmm. Okay. So do you have flexibility in your in implant, the implant design? Okay. Okay. So for knee, okay. Thanks for the question. Okay. For knee uh, implants, right? Okay. It's a uh, it's very complex actually. Yeah. So for knee implants, basically, uh, if yes, the flexibility comes not in the in the flexibility of the material, but more of the articulation of the implant. So. For the implant, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just draw the border. Okay, so basically your, your lower your lower knee, okay, this is a, somebody is the your the knee, yeah. So this is the bone tissue. Okay, so if we do a knee trans, a knee imp, uh, implantation, we will drill a hole here, okay, and then we will implant the we impl implant this this is the implant that is will go in here. It's a, it's a ball, okay. This is called a femoral ball, and then we have a articular cup that is here. Okay, so this portion, right? Okay, this is the thing that actually caused your knee to bend, right? We have the your femoral ball and then your articular cup. So, I guess why the knee could not bend is because perhaps the material that was used, right, did not allow the ball and the cup to to rotate. That means the the portion here is a lot of uh, friction, so the knee couldn't bend. Okay, so uh, in this in this case, yes, we have to actually. In, in when we design the, the implant using the system, we have to input such that we have to find materials that have low frictional, uh, have low friction uh, factor here to allow the movement of the bending knee. And that is only the first thing. Uh, second thing is also this portion here, the stem. A lot of uh, knee replacement uh, patients, they, they find themselves unable to walk after several years. Why? Because the, this portion of the stem 
more rigid than the surrounding bone. Okay, the bone is not totally rigid. Uh, the bone actually has some amount of flexibility. It can, it can bend a little bit and stuff. So when this implant in the, in the middle is more uh, rigid than the surrounding tissue, you will have something what we call stress shielding. Okay, and this causes the bone, the surrounding bones to start to decay because the bone doesn't absorb any more stress. Okay, one thing about why our, our, we are so, you know, our bones are strong now is because every day we walk. When we walk, our bones strengthen because of stress. But when you take away the stress, when you put the implant there, you take away the stress, the bone will start to decay. And then once it decay, after several years, the patient cannot walk anymore. So we have to also design the implant such that it can have the same, it can uh, dis distribute the stress to the surrounding bone tissue such that the patient still can experience stress in the neck, in the leg. If not, you will not be able to walk anymore. Yeah. Uh, any, any more questions? Uh, don't be shy. Uh. I'm, I'm very open. Uh. You can ask anything. Uh. Yeah. Even not any things that are not related to here, so I can, you can ask. Oh, yes. Okay, maybe for this uh, trachea implant, right? Okay, so for this trachea implant, um, sad to say that we only tested on two patients and about maybe 10, about 10 animal models. So we are still trying to uh, improve the design because this work uh, was done quite some time ago and then uh, after, after the work has finished, uh, no one continued on. So it's still a work in progress, yeah. So only two patients have uh, enjoyed it. But of course, we did other kind of uh, devices that was used. Like we also designed an uh, artificial voice uh, box for patients who have voice cancer. And then after they have the voice box removed, we can use this to talk. So it's an implantable voice box. So that one, we had about six to 10 patients uh, using it. And it's still undergoing uh, clinical trials. So one thing about Singapore, right, that is different from a lot of countries is that Singapore has very strict um, regulations. So if you want to, to, to you know, use a, you want to sell an implant, you have to go through 15, 20 years of uh, experiment before you can release. So that's one thing bad about it because you know, 15, 20 years, a lot of life could, could have been saved. But then because of the rules, you know, a lot of patients have to wait for the implant to be released. So that's one thing bad. Uh, yeah. So this one, uh, the design cost. Uh, okay, the design cost uh, well, will be hard to, hard to see. Uh. Production cost, okay, production cost, I can tell you. Uh, for one implant, it, let's say if you rebuild it, well, maybe it costs around $500. 500 uh, Singapore dollars, yeah. So it's, actually, it's not that expensive, uh, about $500, yeah. The, what will cost more is the surgeon visa uh, to actually <laughs> cut open and uh, stuff, yeah. Yeah, so maybe we, could, we can be design a robotic surgeon in the future uh, to replace the surgeon. Uh. So that will save more cost. Uh. Yeah. Oh, any more questions? Okay, if, if not, if you are shy, you can later, I mean, during lunch or what, you can just come and ask me, uh, right, if you are shy. Uh. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful speech. We are happy to hear the significance of rule-based classification, genetic algorithm optimization, FEM evaluation of implants, virtual reality in patient-specific medical devices. We love to hear again from you in future. Thank you, sir. We will wait for a few more minutes for the next, next esteemed, esteemed speaker.